Our, our scripture reading this morning comes from James chapter 1, verse 27. It says this, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Pastor Pete, great job doing our scripture reading this morning. Thank you so much. So good, yeah. The announcements were good too, by the way. I like it. Uh, will you pray with me as we prepare our hearts for the message today? God of truth, we are so grateful that we can come to you and experience the truth, not just in terms of information, but in terms of you as a person, because you are truth, you are true, you are reliable, you are honest, you are fair, you are just. We're grateful for that, and we give you our praise for the fact that you are these things. Lord, in a world where people lie to us, where people tell us partial truths, have truths, where people manipulate the truth for their purposes, we are just so grateful that you have given us your word. You tell us that your word is truth. So we can come to the scriptures and we can discover and experience truth and experience you. And we're so grateful for that and we give you thanks. And we would ask that today that the Holy Spirit would allow us to see and experience truth in terms of information, but also in terms of you as being truth. We ask for the Holy Spirit to speak through me words that are honoring, but are also truthful. And may you fill me with your spirit so I can do so well. Lord, we continue to pray for the world around us and for the difficulties and even tragedies that are going on around the world. Many of them related to the pandemic, some related to weather, some related to people's reactions to things and their sinful nature. Lord, we just cry out to you and ask you to help us and rescue us. And Lord, help us to be part of the solution and not part of the problem in the world around us. Help us to live in a way that we show that we love you and that we love our neighbors. Lord, help us to be better Christians because we've been here today, fellowshipping together and studying your word. And we ask all these things in the matchless name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Well, I'd like to start with a little song, and if you know it, you children's song, you're welcome to sing with me if you want, but it goes like this. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red, brown, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Now, that's what Jesus feels about different races. Any questions? And if you were to sing that song and put your name in there instead of Jesus, would it be true of you that you love all the children of the world? Red, brown, yellow, black, and white. Are they all precious in your sight? And by children, we don't mean just three-year-olds or 13-year-olds or 30-year-olds. Or We also mean 63-year-olds and 83-year-olds. People of every age and every race, are they precious in your sight? They are in the sight of Jesus. Today, as we continue our series, A World in Crisis, the title is A World in Crisis, and I kind of like the title, so I want to remind you what it is, Justice or Just Us. Justice or Just Us. Because just us means we're kind of self-centered and selfish, and that really isn't justice. There were seven University of Portland students who all were taking their minor in social justice. And they did a survey on campus on the University of Portland amongst 80 staff and faculty and students. And they asked them one question. They asked them, what does social injustice mean? Social injustice, what does it mean? And these seven university students concluded that there is no single answer as they did their survey. No single answer to the question, what does social injustice mean? It means different things to different people. Well, I checked with Webster's Dictionary Online to look up the definition of justice, and Webster's tells us that justice is the quality of being impartial or fair. The quality of being impartial or fair. And then it goes on to give some synonyms, and one of the synonyms I like of justice is the term fair shake. Fair shake. 
And I was wondering where that came from. I was thinking like a fair handshake, but it doesn't come from that. It comes from the shake of the dice, the roll of the dice. And the idea is that a fair shake is you give everybody an equal chance, an equal opportunity, a fair shake of the dice. And social justice is a society where everybody gets a fair shake, the same chances where things are impartial and they are fair, regardless of your race or your gender or your religion. The first president that I remember as a boy, there were presidents when I was a boy I don't remember, but the first president I remember as a boy is former President John F. Kennedy. And anyone who was alive when he was assassinated will probably be able to tell you exactly where they were when they heard the news that he had been assassinated. I was in fourth grade, I was in school. I remember a teacher came into the middle of our class in tears and she whispered something to our teacher and our teacher started to cry immediately. And two teachers in front of the class are sobbing and our students have no idea what's going on. And so we start talking to each other and the only thing we could think of as fourth graders was that the first teacher had just gotten fired. And that's what we're thinking. Well, it turns out that things were much worse than that, of course, and I went home that day and I remember watching on our black and white television a replay of the horrible event. But John F. Kennedy had something to say about social justice, and I'd like to quote what John F. Kennedy said. He said, all of us do not have equal talent, but all of us should have an equal opportunity to develop our talent. Equal opportunity to develop our talent. There's another American president, and he put it quite well. He put it this way, a little, more, a little more lengthy. He says, now, as a nation, we don't promise equal outcomes, but we were founded on the idea everybody should have an equal opportunity to succeed, no matter who you are, what you look like. That's an essential promise of America. Where you start should not determine where you end up. And then a short quote from... A American, an American journalist says, America guarantees equal opportunity, not equal outcome. All good quotes. You might find it interesting that that last quote is by conservative talk show host Rush Limbaugh, and the previous presidential quote was by former President Barack Obama. Who knew Rush Limbaugh and Barack Obama had so much in common? <laughs> One more quote I'd like to give you in a minute is from perhaps one of our favorite presidents, the 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. And I was reminded from Wikipedia that Abraham Lincoln led the nation through the American Civil War, which was the country's greatest moral, constitutional, and political crisis. And he succeeded in preserving the Union, abolishing slavery, and modernizing the United States economy. Lincoln himself was born into poverty. He was born into, in a log cabin in Indiana. He, he was self-educated, became a lawyer, and then became our 16th president. And in a speech that is considered one of the most famous speeches in American history, the Gettysburg Address, a speech that is only 10 sentences long, given at the time of America's bloodiest war, more Americans died in the Civil War than any other war. And he gave the Gettysburg Address at the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg. And the Civil War was a war fought over the horrific social injustice of slavery. And in this speech, referring to our nation's declaration of independence and the formation of our nation, Abraham Lincoln said this, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Social justice is part of the framework of the United States of America. And whether you're a political conservative or a political liberal, you agree with that. But to the degree that we have succeeded or failed at giving people equal opportunity in implementing social justice, your view of that often depends on whether you are the victim of social injustice 
or you are the perpetrator of social injustice. Without becoming too political, without offending everybody in this room, I'd like us to talk about social justice and injustice today based on the scriptures and personal experience. And from that, I want to offer you three observations. If you're taking notes, there's an outline in the bulletin, and if you didn't get one, you're welcome to go to the back and, and grab one for yourself at this time. But three observations. The first one is this. Social injustice, social injustice is often excused by those it benefits. It's often excused by those it benefits. And that blank that has the blank excused, you also could put in the word overlooked, because perhaps the person doesn't realize they're being social unjust. They've just overlooked it, ignored it. But you could also put the word denied in there, because some people go, oh, that's not social injustice. That's just their fair shake. That's what they get. So they deny it. And another word you could put in there is supported. Social injustice is often supported by those it benefits. Slavery in America greatly benefited the southern plantation owners. So they not only excused it, they promoted it because it was to their benefit to dehumanize other human beings and put them in slavery. And our nation's bloodiest war was fought over this social injustice. But social injustice is often excused denied, overlooked, even supported by those it benefits. And that's one of the problems. Jesus gave some of his harshest rebukes to those who benefited themselves from social injustice. There's some parallel passages in Luke and in Matthew, and we want to look at Luke 20 first, and then we'll go over to Matthew, which are some parallel passages. In Luke chapter 20, verse 46, Jesus is speaking to religious leaders of his day to the scribes. And he says, beware of the scribes, verse 46, who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor and banquets. So these are very self-centered, arrogant people, prideful. And then he says, who devour widows' houses. Well, that's a metaphor, of course. They're not eating the house what they're doing is they're perhaps taking the houses away from these widows, something economically or forcing them out or doing something, but it's a social injustice against some of the most vulnerable people in their society, and yet they are the ones who want others to look up to them. And they devour widows' houses, and for appearance sake, often long prayers, and Jesus concludes these will receive greater condemnation. There are degrees of punishment, degrees of condemnation. And when it comes to social injustice with arrogant religious people who are oppressing the poor, Jesus isn't very happy with that and says you will have greater condemnation. And in Matthew 23, a parallel passage where Jesus gives a number of woes against religious conservatives in his day, the Pharisees as well as the scribes, Jesus says this in Matthew 23, verse 23. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He doesn't mince words. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin. In other words, you give 10% of the spices that you grow to the God. You are so careful about the smallest thing. And yet you've neglected the weightier provisions of the law. And the next word is justice. You have not maintained justice, even though you are really particular about obeying the small things of God's law in terms of tithing. Justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the other things, he says. And then in verse 25, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, that means how you look on the outside, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. That's the inside of you. And notice he says self-indulgence. Self-indulgence blinds you to social injustice because they benefited 
from the social injustice. They were self-indulgent. They were selfish. The root cause of all injustices, the root cause of all injustices is the same as the root cause of every other sin. It is selfishness, self-indulgence, selfishness. That's why we have the title, it's either justice or just us. And when it's just us, we are being self-indulgent and we're not giving justice to other people. A person blinded by their own selfishness and their own prosperity is often not likely to notice or care about the social injustices going on around them to others. But there are exceptions. And one of the sections, exceptions is a Jewish man named Boaz, who is one of the wonderful exceptions. One of the most beautiful love stories in Scripture takes place during one of the darkest hours of Israel's history. In fact, there's a period of time that in Judges chapter 21, verse 25, is summarized this way. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In other words, each person was the source of their own morality. Does that sound familiar? Everyone picked their own morality. It was extreme selfishness and self-indulgence. And during this period of social unrest, injustice, and moral decay, there was a wealthy Jewish man, a landowner, who loved God and loved other people. And that's the story of Ruth. And he exemplifies the most beautiful example of social justice. This man's name, Boaz, in Hebrew means by strength. And the damsel in distress in the story is a woman by the name of Ruth, and Ruth's name means beauty. But Ruth had two big strikes against her. First, she was a poor widow. And secondly, she was an alien. She was a non-Jew. And not just any non-Jew. She was a Moabitess. She was from the nation of Moab. And Moabites were descendants of the incestuous relationship between Lot and his oldest daughter. And the Moabites were the Jews' enemies. In fact, during the period of Judges, the Moabites had invaded Israel and subjugated them for 18 years. In the book of Psalms, when God speaks of Moab, he calls them his wash pot. And it was the Moabite women during the day of Moses that enticed the Jewish men into immorality and idolatry. And so God set a judgment of a plague and wiped out 24,000 people because of the influence of the Moabite women. And Ruth was a Moabitess. So at first glance, Ruth was anything but a good catch. She was poor. She was destitute, she was a widow, and she was from an enemy nation. But God has a big heart for widows and for orphans. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God instructs us to care for widows and orphans, to be socially just to the people who need us most. I'd like to look at one passage in the Old Testament and the one in the New the Old Testament passage is in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 12. And in Deuteronomy 26, 12, God is giving the law to the people. Deuteronomy comes from two Greek words, means second law. It's the second time God has given these laws. He gave it to them before the 40-year wandering in the wilderness, and he gave them again after the 40 years because the generation had died out, so he gives the law again. So that's why I read Deuteronomy. You go, I think I've read that before. Well, you probably have. God gives the law again. And in 26.12, he says, when you have finished paying all the tithe of your increase in the third year. A tithe is 10%. You can't give a tithe of 5%. That's not a tithe. Tithe means 10%. So when you give your tithe, you're giving 10%. And they had to give a tithe of 10% of the increase in the third year, the year of tithing. And then he says, what do you do with this tithe? Then you shall give it to the Levite. Those are the servants in the temple, the people who serve in the temple. You'll also distribute it to the strangers in the land. Those would be non-Jews, people who are not like you. And you'll give it to the orphan and to the widow. 
So these could be Jewish widows and orphans. They're destitute. They need your help. And your money is going to help them that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. You are feeding the poor. That was part of God's law. And remember, at this time, it's a theocracy. God is the head of the government. The government is run by God. These are God's laws. Take care of those who are most needy in your community. And then we come over to the New Testament, and we find out it's a New Testament principle in James chapter 1, verse 27. In James 1, 27, it says, this is pure and undefiled religion. Now, if you're going to define pure and undefiled religion, what would you say? Most of us would answer that theologically. You believe in this, you believe in that. But it's defined here practically by what you do. Because it's not enough to have good theology, you have to have good practice. And so it says, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father to visit orphans and widows in their distress. Who are the most marginalized people in their community? Widows and orphans. And he says, you visit them in their distress, and you don't just say, be warm and be filled, as James will tell us later in the book. You help meet their needs. So here's a second observation for us about social injustice. And that's this, number two, a second observation, social injustice breaks God's law and God's heart. Social injustice breaks God's law, but it also breaks his heart because he cares for the marginalized. He cares for the poor. He cares for the stranger and the outcast. He cares for the widow and the orphans. My mom was 32 years old was a widow with two small children, four-year-old Trisha and six-year-old Tally, two little girls, when the man who would become my father married her. But she wasn't the best catch because she was a widow with two small children, and she wasn't even Greek like my dad. <laughs> but he married her anyway. And one day, they went to the court, and the man who had become my dad legally adopted Tally and Trisha. And when they got home, Mom told Tally and Trisha they'd been adopted and, and that Dad was now their dad. And Tally started to cry. My mom said, why are you crying? And she said, I don't need any judge to tell me he's my daddy. Dad loved the widow and orphan, and so does our Heavenly Father. And Boaz also loved the widow. Now, God had set up a great system for helping the poor, and helping the poor help themselves. And the way it was set up is that if you were a landowner, a farmer, and you were harvesting, you weren't supposed to harvest the whole field. You're supposed to leave the corners unharvested, and if the day ended and you didn't get everything harvested and you left some bushels behind, you left them behind. And then the poor would go in the field behind you, and they could glean after your workers, and whatever they gleaned, they got to keep for themselves. And the same was true if you had olive trees or if you had grapevines, that you would leave some fruit on the tree or on the vine for the poor. And it was a fine system where the poor were given self-respect and the ability to work and to help themselves, but the wealthy also could be generous. It was a great system. And God did that because social injustice breaks his heart. And he wanted to make sure that people could be socially just and help one another. Well, as our love story in the book of Ruth unfolds, we find that this foreign widow starts gleaning in Boaz's field. And that's going to lead to marriage between the two. Now, I'm going to read 13 verses of Ruth chapter 2. And I know you're not supposed to read that much scripture in church at one time. Whoever said that, I don't know, but it seems to be the way. But I'm going to read 13 stimulating, beautiful, wonderful verses. And I'd encourage you, you may want to just close your eyes and listen to the story if you promise to open them when I'm done. Listen to these 13 verses, a portion of the story. Now, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. 
He's a man of strength. And Ruth, her name means beauty, the Moabitess said to Naomi, who's her mother-in-law, please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. And Naomi said to her, go, my daughter. So she's implementing what God had, she's taking advantage of what God had implemented that the poor can go glean in the field. So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz. Now, to her, it just sort of happened. It was a coincidence, but I think God smiles here. Oh, yeah, you think, you think it just happened? <laughs> and it happened that she came to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Look at that relationship between this employer and his employees. He blesses them. He's a godly man, and they recognize that. Then Boaz said to his servant who is in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? Kind of like, whoa, who is that? (laughs) And the servant in charge of the reapers answered and said, She is a young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, Please, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now. She has been sitting in the house for a little while. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Now we can answer that question because he's a godly man, and he believes in social justice. And Boaz answered and said to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. And how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Well, if you know the story that they fall in love, and they get married, and they start a family. And we get a third observation from this, and that is this. Our third observation is that everyone benefits. Everyone benefits from social justice. Everyone does. Boaz and Ruth got married, started a family, and in our story, Boaz was better off because he was practicing social justice. He got a wonderful wife. Ruth was better off because of social justice. She got a wonderful husband. Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, was better off because now she's taken care of, and her daughter-in-law now has a family. And all of us are better off because of Boaz's social justice, because Boaz and Ruth had a son named Obed, and Obed became the father of Jesse, and Jesse became the father of King David. And King David... From him would come the Lord Jesus Christ in David's line. In other words, Jesus is is a descendant of this poor foreign widow, Ruth, who experienced social justice. And we are all better off because of it. Everyone benefits from social justice. And that's true whenever we follow God's word. If it wasn't for my dad loving a widow and two orphans, I wouldn't be here and you wouldn't be listening to this sermon. And I'd like to think at least I'm better off. Maybe you are too. So let me ask you, who is being benefited by what you are doing in terms of social justice? Because what you do now is going to reap benefits or consequences for ages to come. Would you pray with me? 
I'd like to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes so you can have a private moment. Jesus came to rescue every one of us by giving his life on the cross to pay for our sins. And he's waiting for each of us to accept that rescue. If you're here and you've never invited Jesus Christ to save you, to rescue you, to forgive your sins and to give you the gift of heaven, of eternal life, if you're here and you recognize that desire and that need to be saved, I would encourage you to speak to him right now in prayer and to say something like this. Lord Jesus, I recognize my need to be rescued, to be saved. I believe you died for my sins, you rose from the grave and conquered death, and I ask you to come into my life today and to save me. And I say thank you, Lord. Lord, as we continue to pray, we ask that you would forgive us where we have overlooked, denied, accepted social injustice in our lives and community, and pray that you would use us to be part of the solution, that we would treat others with a fair shake and love them like you do. And we pray all these things in that unifying name, the name Jesus Christ. Amen.